Hi, and welcome to Graphs for Data Science with NetworkX. In this tutorial, I'm going to cover how you can use graph theory and graph algorithms to better understand and explore your data sets as part of your data science framework. You can find the entire slide deck and all the Jupyter notebooks that go with each section in the tutorial GitHub repository that you see on your screen right now. I also run a graphs for data science substack that covers every once every couple of weeks or every month a different application of a graph algorithm or a graph analysis approach to a real world data set. And I encourage you to subscribe if it's something you are you are interested in. My name is Bruno Gonçalves. I'm currently a senior data scientist working at the intersection of data science and finance. My background is in physics and computer science, but my work if dating as far back as my PhD years always revolved around using graph approaches or graph algorithms, or as we would call them in physics, complex networks approaches to studying real world data sets, usually from some type of online source. So things such as social media, Twitter, Wikipedia, online access logs, uh, router traces, etc. Uh, please reach out to me on social media through email and LinkedIn if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, and so on. Without further ado, let's get started. Our tutorial will be divided into four sections. Each section corresponds to a different uh, real world data set. We're going to be using a different data set and exploring a different data set in each of these four sections. And each section has associated with it also in a Jupyter notebook that covers all the material that we're, we're going to go through in the slide decks here. So I, I encourage you at the end of each section to go to the GitHub repository and work with the Jupyter notebook so they get a better understanding of exactly how these approaches work and how you can apply them to real world data sets. We're going to start with a simple graphs 101 type introduction. For this, we're going to use the airline transportation network, which is a well-known uh, network that has easily available uh, data that you can download from uh, the Bureau of Transportation Statistics website. In section two, we're going to be looking at searching and navigating on graphs. So essentially how to get directions. And for this, we're going to use the OpenStreetMap data set that we're going to query using the OSMNX uh, package. In section three, we're going to be focusing on graph connectivity. How is the graph connected? weakly connected, strongly connected, and so on. And for this, we're going to be using a sample of the Bitcoin transaction network. So we're going to use these graph algorithms essentially to identify wallets, to identify sets of Bitcoin addresses that are controlled by the same person or, or institution. And finally, on, in part four, we're going to have a very quick overview of some properties of social networks. And for this, we're going to use a small a Twitter reply network that we're going to obtain from the Stanford Networks repository. So let's get started. First question is, what exactly is a graph? And why do I sometimes say graphs and sometimes say networks? A network is essentially a system that is constituted by nodes, which correspond to subcomponents of our system that are interconnected by links. And these links can correspond to any type of connection, relationship, interaction, etc. In physics, which is my background, we tend to use the word network as, as part of our, our jargon. Uh, mathematicians, for instance, tend to, and computer scientists, depending on the context, tend to use more the, the word graph. In practice, I use them more or less interchangeably. Although, depending on who you ask, some might say that there are some technical differences with networks being a subset of graphs. For our, 
for our purposes, you can just think of graphs and networks as being the same thing, the two different words to mean the same thing. Mathematically, a network or a graph is simply a set of vertices. So these are our components and edges connecting vertices. The edges are just a tuple of two nodes, V and V prime in our, in our notation. And we can distinguish between directed edges, meaning that there is a link, a directed link, an arrow pointing from uh, node V to node V prime or undirected links, which essentially means that you can travel along the edge in either direction. An easy way of thinking about it is you have one-way streets or two-way streets. These streets can also be wider or with more lanes or narrower, and this would correspond, for example, to the weight of the of the edge. So we can associate a numerical value to each edge that represents the capacity of the edge, how long the edge is, or any other type of numerical property we might be interested in. Now that we have a quick overview of the notation and the basic concept of what a graph and a network is, let's look at a few practical examples. One that I'm sure you're very familiar with, it's Facebook. Here, each node is a Facebook user. The links or the edges are essentially friendship relationships between Facebook users. As you know, if I'm your friend on Facebook, you're also my friend, so the links are undirected in this case. So this is known as a social network, and in this specific example, an online social network, because the individual nodes represent individual people. A classical example, of another of a social, real world social network is, instead of the online social network is a Zachary Karate Club. So this is a social network of a university karate club in the 70s, where each node in this network corresponds to an actual uh, member of that club. You, you see from just looking at this picture that you have two nodes that are highly connected that have many uh, links, and these are the two main instructors. This network became famous because the two instructors had the falling off and the network essentially broke in two. So it's a classical example of how networks break and how communities form within networks. Another good example is that of scientific collaborations. Here what we have is that each node is a scientist and two scientists, two nodes are connected whenever they co-author a paper together. And for this specific data set, we're actually using the PRL, so physical review letters, database of papers and who published with whom. Another historical example is the Florentine weddings, which essentially describes the marriage relationship between families in, in Florence, in Italy, and that essentially helps us understand how the Medici became such a prominent family in, in Florence that essentially controlled the, the entire city simply because they were extremely central in this network and they were able to create these alliances. Another one of my favorite examples is the face-to-face -face contact network in the primary school. And this was a work done by some researchers in France and Italy, where essentially they gave little badges to children in the primary school. So from first grade to fifth grade, each grade has two classes, A and B. And the little badges, what they do essentially, they measure whenever two children interact with one another face to face. So you can see here how exactly you have a lot of information about the structure of the social relationships between the children. You can see how children tend to associate with other children in their class or within their age range, more or less. You have very few connections between, for example, fifth grade students and first grade students, but you have a lot more between first and second grade, second and third, and so on. I'll just summarize. Um, a graph is simply a mathematical object that has nodes and edges. The nodes are individual elements. The edges represent the connections between them. The degree of the node is simply the number of edges that are connected to that node. If the edges are directed, you can speak of in-degree and out-degree. So nodes going coming in and nodes going out, or rather 
edges coming in and edges going out. The edges can be weighted, so you can have a numerical value associated with them, and they can be directed or undirected. Typically, you will find graphs and graph data sets that come in one uh, of these uh, typical representations. The most common one, perhaps, is the edge list. So this is simply a list, or a, a most commonly a text file, where each row corresponds to an individual edge. And you have, an, in each row, the two nodes that constitute the edge, and maybe some other information about the edge itself, like the weight or some other attributes. A more mathematically convenient uh, representation is that of the adjacency matrix. And here what you have is an, a matrix that has n rows and n columns. And here n is simply the number of nodes. And each element on this matrix is either 0 or 1. 1 representing that there is an edge, 0 representing that there is no edge. Uh, for in the case of unweighted networks, if the values of the elements of the matrix are simple, are not equal to one, so they have some other numerical value, then that would correspond to an, a weighted network. A third representation, which is very useful when you're thinking about how to actually create a representative data structure in memory, is that of the adjacency list or a dictionary. And here, all we have is a list of all the nodes, and for each node, you have a source, each node is the key, and associated with that key, you have the list of all the other nodes it is connected to, along with any attributes of those edges. Independently of what representation you choose, if the network is undirected, you can save some memory space. You can reduce your storage requirements simply by keeping only one edge direction. So if you have an edge between nodes A and B, you keep only AB, for example, and not BA, with the understanding that every time you see AB, that implies also a, a connection from B to A. So let's consider a simple example. We have here the, the small graph on the right hand side of the slide. And this is what the edge list representation for this graph would look like. So we have uh, in the first row AB, that represents the, the link, the edge between nodes A and node B, then AC, AE, and so on. Uh, if we wanted to include weights in this representation, then each tuple, so each row of this list would have the numerical value of the weight next to it as the third uh, element of this tuple. One thing to note here is that node F, which is isolated in this graph, never appears in the edge list. No, this is, of course, due to the fact that F doesn't actually have any edges associated with them with it, and so it's excluded from the edge list. This is a way of highlighting the fact that the edge list in particular only includes, unless you modify it in some way, only includes the nodes that actually have degree equal to one or more. The GCC matrix then will give us this uh, matrix that we have here. We need to have some way of mapping the node IDs to the rows and columns of the matrix. In this case, it's relatively simple. We just associate a number 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on with each letter of the alphabet, and then you can map it directly. You will see that if the network is undirected, this matrix will be diagonal. If you don't allow, which is a very common case, uh, self loops, so self edges, so a, an edge from B to B, for example, then that means that the diagonal of this matrix is always zero. Finally, the adjacency list or, or dictionary representation is simply a dictionary where you're mapping each node to all the other nodes it is connected to. 
here you can actually include the nodes with zero and just simply by creating a key in the dictionary that maps to a, an empty list or another empty dictionary. Now that we have a way of representing uh, graphs, let's look at our first data set. So here we're going to consider the airline transportation network. We're going to get this data from the Bureau of Transportation Statistics that collects a huge amount of information about the transportation infrastructure of the US. One of the databases that's available in this website is, is the T100 domestic segment table. It essentially contains information about flights between any two airports serviced by a US carrier. So what this means is most airports in the world will be included. Most of the flight, almost in the totality of flights within the US will also be included. And you also have some international flights that are operated by US airlines or US carriers. In this specific example, this specific data set, each row corresponds to one edge in this edge list type format. It actually corresponds to one individual flight. So a flight happening at a specific date, at a specific time. So if you have mo multiple flights, between the same pair of airports as you usually have, daily flights and so on, this will correspond to multiple rows in this table. The airports here, we're gonna consider them to be the individual nodes, the edges will be these individual flights. The weight on our edges is simply the number of passengers traveling from this origin to this destination. For simplicity and to make our lives a little bit easier, we're going to aggregate the total number of passengers. So instead of considering individual flights, we're, we're considering individual uh, connections. And the, and the weight of these connections will simply be the total number of passengers traveling from the orange to the destination in total over the course of a year, which is the time span covered by our data set. So essentially what we have is a directed uh, weighted graph directed because the flights start at the origin, end at the destination, weighted because we have a number of passengers traveling. The nodes in our graph are simply the airports. For simplicity, we're going to focus on the airports and flights within the contiguous 40, 48 states. We represent the flights as being the edges and the weight of the edge as being the number of passengers as being the width of the line connecting the two airports. So this is essentially what our network looks like. So you can see that there are immediately some patterns that, that appear. You have a lot of flights going up and down the East Coast. You have a large number of flights also go traveling from coast to coast and then several other smaller regional flights. You saw the one of the most fundamental properties of, of a network is the degree distribution. So the node has degree k, where k is the number of edges that it connects to. If the network is directed, then you can distinguish between in degree, so number of incoming edges, and out degree, number of outgoing edges. You can define the degree sequence. So this is simply the ordered sequence of the degree of each of the nodes. And the degree distribution, which is simply the relative frequency or the relative probability that if I pick a node at random, it will have degree k. So this is a, a relatively simple uh, summary of the connectivity properties of a network. Empirical networks actually have a wide range of degree distributions. The most common ones are Poissonian, Gaussian, or, or power law distribution. Uh, Poissonian distributions tend to be characteristic of random or geometric processes. And we're gonna look at them somewhat briefly later on. And power law distributions tend to be very common in any type of process or any type of network that results from a, a process with some physical constraints such as preferential attachment, meaning that the rich get richer, so nodes with higher degree, that some nodes will have extremely high degree and other nodes will have relatively small degree. So this is known also as the 80-20 rule, coming, uh, originally defined by Pareto in, in 
economics that says essentially 80% of the wealth is owned by just 20% of the population, also popularized in the early 2000s as the long tail idea. And to give you an idea of how the distribution impacts the structure of the network, we have here a quick comparison between two networks with two very different degree distributions. On the left, we have the interstate uh, network, where here each node is a city. The links connecting the nodes, the edges connecting the nodes are the interstate uh, highway system. While on the right-hand side, we have a similar network where the nodes again are cities, but now the edges connecting the cities are uh, airline flights, like in the airline transportation network. And you see that the structure of the network looks very different. On one hand, in the interstate network, you have all no most nodes with a relatively well-defined uh, degree. So they all have roughly around the same number of, of connections. While on the case of the airline network, you have this very broad uh, degree distribution that essentially corresponds means that you have some hubs, some very central uh, airports, and a lot of peripheral airports with very few connections. Indeed, when we plot the degree distribution, the in and the out degree distribution for the BTS dataset, you find that it looks linear on a log-log scale. And this is a classical signature of a power law distribution. Of course, you could also perform maximum likelihood estimation of the exponent of this of this, this distribution to identify exactly what the exponent is, which will give you some more information about the structure of the network. For our purposes, let's just say we agree that this is a power law distribution, or at least a very broad tailed distribution, where most nodes have degree one or two, and a few nodes have several hundred connections. Now, of course, the way the nodes are connected to one another is also important. So this is just the idea of the nearest neighbors. So the neighbors of a node are the nodes that it's directly connected to, but sit on the opposite side of the edges. And correlations. So correlations are essentially how likely it is that the node of degree k will be co connected to a node of degree k prime. So you can derive this expression relatively simple. So you can get a joint product distribution p k k prime, which is simply the number of node number of edges connecting nodes of degree k and nodes of degree k prime, normalized by a constant, which is simply the average degree of the network times the number of nodes in the network. From this simple expression, you can of course reobtain the degree distribution, but also the conditional probability, which is the one that's most interesting for our purposes. So the probability of a node of an edge connecting to a node of degree k prime, if you know, or given that you know, that on the other side of the edge, it starts at the node of degree k. This gives us a, a two-point uh, function, so k and k prime, that is hard to analyze and to, and to visualize, so it's actually commonly summarized using the average degree distribution of the nearest neighbors of a node as a function of the degree of that node. So this is typically represented as k and n of k, average. And this simple expression is actually enough to give us a lot of information about the structure of the network. You typically find that this function follows one of three behaviors, it can have an upward trend so that nodes of degree k tend to have neighbors also of high degree k. It can have a downward trend where nodes of small degree k are typically connected to nodes of high degree k and vice versa. Or it can be uncorrelated where you have no relationship so that the function is actually flat. Uh, on the, in the first case where you have an upward slope, we call the network assortative. And this is typical of social networks. So famous people interact with other famous people. Uh, unknown people interact with other unknown people. Well, 
On the other hand, technological networks like the airline network tend to be disassortative, meaning that you have hubs and you have smaller airports or smaller nodes connected to these hubs so that act as more efficient ways of distributing or transporting some uh, good, let's say. When we plot the degree distribution, the degree correlation, so the average degree of the nearest neighbor as a function of the degree for uh, the BTS transportation network, you find a clear disassociative trend. So the, the value starts going down and then you have also this kind of hump around k equals 100 that essentially corresponds to finite size effects, which means that this is due to the fact that the network is not infinite and that you're essentially only sampling a small fraction of the total uh, possible connections of this network. You can also summarize the average degree of the nearest neighbors as a function of the degree using the sortativity coefficient. So this is just the Pearson correlation coefficient of the degrees of a node at each side of the edge. A, a positive value of R means that nodes of high degree tend to connect preferentially to nodes of low degree, or rather to nodes of high degree and vice versa. It's known as the rich club effect or preferential attachment. While a negative uh, value of the sortativity coefficient means that nodes of high degree tend to connect to nodes of low degree. So you have a hierarchical or a hub and spoke tree-like structure. In this slide, we have a quick summary of several empirical, empirical networks along with some of their properties. But in particular, we have on the second to last column, we have the value of the assortativity coefficient. And you can see that social networks tend to have, with small exceptions, uh, a positive value of assortativity, technological networks and biological networks, in contrary, tend to have a negative value of the assortative, assortativity. We can also look at the function of k in, so the number of edges arriving at the node versus k out, the number of edges pointing out from the node. And these, of course, would tend to be uh, highly correlated or strongly correlated. This means in particular, one direct consequence of this is that you tend to have no dead end airports. So you, don't, you typically don't have airports that receive a lot of flights, but don't have a lot of outgoing flights. So where people mostly just arrive and never leave or vice versa. As we mentioned, edge weights can represent connection strength. So how many passengers, how many cars, how strong the connection is, connection frequency. So how often do we travel between these two cities? How often do we call one another and so on? Also physical distance. So could be flight time, could be distance in miles and so on. The node strength is essentially the weighted uh, version of the degree is simply the sum of all the weights of all the edges that are incoming or outgoing from the net, from that specific node. And of course, weights tend to be strongly related with network topology. So when we plot the distribution of weights for our airline transportation network, you see again that you have a broad tail distribution with some nodes having a weight of a thousand or less. So you in the course of a year, only a thousand people traveled along that edge. And a few edges that have weights of several million passengers, which basically means that you had several million people traveling along that edge. A similar pattern is observed also for the strength. And here we can see that the in strength and the out strength. And you and here you see that you have for major hubs, so large airports like, for instance, Atlanta, uh, O'Hare, uh, Atlanta, O'Hare in Chicago, JFK in New York, and so on. You have 
these large airports that handle several tens of millions of passengers per year. Not surprisingly, the in strength and the out strength are also strongly correlated, which essentially means that most flights are also return flights. So you have a flight going from A to B, you will typically also have a flight from B to A. And in general, of course, there are exceptions when you're moving or so on. If you're if one person is flying from A to B, a few days later or a few weeks later, he or she will also fly back from B to A. As one might expect, there's also a strong relationship between the degree and the strength. Nodes, in this case airports, with higher in or out degree will tend to have correspondingly higher in or out strength. But of course, the relationship is not trivial and this essentially points us to the relative importance or the relative uh, structural location of each specific airport. So you can have airports with relatively small number of flights that have a lot of traffic, while most airports tend to have relatively small number of flights and also relatively small number of passengers traveling. So this brings us to the end of the first section. So here I would recommend that you stop playing the video and jump over to the GitHub repository and explore the first notebook. The names of the notebooks match the names of the sections and they're also numbers from one to four and they cover every single topic that we go through in the slides so you can look at the code and understand better what it's doing. In fact, every single in empirical figure that you saw, like the degree distribution, uh, weight distributions and so on is generated from these notebooks. So you can observe exactly how you go from the raw data set to the final product, to the final figure. So you have the entire pipeline, the entire uh, sequence of analysis that you have to perform, which I believe will give you a leg up when it comes to applying the these approaches and these analysis in your own uh, practical ap applications. Now let's start with section two, searching in graphs. So here what we're trying to understand now is now that we have a better understanding of the structure and the topology of the graph and how nodes are related to one another, how weights impact the, the structure of the network, how weights are related to degrees and so on, we can start thinking about dynamical processes happening on top of this. In particular, we can start thinking about how we can think about walking or traveling on top of this graph. So each edge, of course, represents a path connecting nodes I to J. In the case of the airline connection network, that's obvious. You have an actual flight. In the case of a road network, as we'll see here, that also corresponds to an actual road. But in other applications, in other type of networks, this connection is not as clear. For example, in the case of Facebook, you can think of paths on this graph as being for instance, the way that specific memes or specific peeps, pieces of information travel along the graph. So I can post something on my wall. If you're my friend, you can see it and share it with your friends. And another one of your friends can see it and share it as well. And you can see how this specific post or this specific meme traveled through the network. Let's start by considering, just for conceptual clarity, an adjacency matrix representation of a network. So here we have a matrix A, the typical name. And if each edge on this network, so if each element of this matrix corresponds to a path connecting nodes I and nodes J, you can see that by taking products or powers of this adjacency matrix, you can essentially count how many ways that are to go from one node to another node. So there is no adjacency matrix A. The number of paths between nodes 
i and j if they are connected is one in the case of undirect of unweighted networks or some other value in the case of uh, weighted networks if you take the square of the matrix then you you're counting the number of paths between nodes i and j in two steps so yeah so you go from i to k from k to j and you're summing over all values of k if you take the third power then you have the number of paths of three steps and so on uh, one interesting property of the square of the gcc matrix is that in the diagonal elements essentially what you have is the degree of the nodes because the only way for you to go from node i back to node i into steps is to visit every single one of its neighbors A path is any sequence of nodes where we traverse each edge at most once, at most once, and the sequence of nodes that we see essentially corresponds to the end result of each step that we take. While a walk is similar to a path, but has no limitation on number of times, so it's just any sequence of nodes that you're visiting by traveling along the edges. You can also define the diameter of a graph as being the average shortest path between all all pairs of nodes. So if you measure the, 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 the minimum distance between every node i and every node j, you take the average and you get the diameter of the network. To clarify a bit what I mean by all of this, let's consider the Zachary Karate Club. I already mentioned this and essentially corresponds to the friendship network of two instructors in the Karate Club of, at the university in the 70s. Uh, <clears throat> it's a relatively small network, it's easy to visualize, so it makes a good uh, case study for us to understand a little bit better what we are, we are talking about here. In particular, one of the things we are interested in understanding better is how can we identify the shortest path or the shortest distance between pairs of nodes in a network. There's three typical algorithms that we're going to cover that are very common, the depth for search, breadth for search, and Dyker's algorithm. Each of these algorithms has their pros and cons, of course. The depth for search, you will essentially keep going far away from the origin until you reach a dead end, and then you backtrack, and then you try moving forward again, and so on. So eventually you will visit every node. So you, you will find a path between the origin and any destination that you want, as long as the graph is connected, as long as there is a path. But this is not guaranteed to be the shortest path. On the other hand, the breadth for search tends to explore the network in concentric shells. So from one node, you visit all of its neighbors, then all the neighbors of the neighbors, all the neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors, and so on. And depth for search and breadth for search are typically used in unweighted networks, or at least in networks for which we are not particularly interested in uh, using the weights of the edges as a metric. So we're only interested in the number of hops. Uh, Dijkstra's algorithm, on the other hand, follows a somewhat similar approach to breadth for search, but instead of going by concentric shells, by number of hops, it actually looks always at the shortest path because it always takes into account the weight of the edge. And essentially, from one step to the next, it will keep extending the the shortest path that it found so far until it reaches its destination or until it calculates and finds the path to every node in the graph. So let's see what these look like in our little toy network. So for depth search for it, in this in the examples I'm going to consider, we're going to start always at node zero. Of course, in your specific case, you can start at any node that you like, and we're going to compute the distance between node zero and every other node in this graph. 
uh, we chose node zero because it, it's central to one part of the network and relatively far away from the other part. So it gives us a nice uh, example of how far off we can stretch out in the network until we find the correct path, till we find the correct way of reaching every node. And in, in this visualization, you will notice that I'm displaying the network just as I had before, but now I'm keeping all the edges to be very thin, except the ones that I find, the ones that I try that I traverse using the depth first search algorithm. I'm switching uh, node colors every time I, I take another hop. So you can see essentially that nodes that have the same color tend to be connected to the same parent. And you can see how the colors seem to be ex essentially randomly, almost randomly assigned throughout the network. So there are no obvious patterns be in, in this, this reversal, because as I said, we keep for with depth first search, you keep following edges until you reach a dead end and then you backtrack and then you keep moving forward and so on. Until eventually you will visit every node, just not in the most efficient way possible. By contrast, we have breadth first search. As before, we're starting our search from node zero and trying to reach every other node. Here you, you can see the concentric shell structure of, of the search by looking at the way the colors are distributed. So you can actually see the concentric shells represented by the colors. Uh, so this gives us a systematic exploration of the network in these concentric shells, which means that in the case of an undirected network, it's guaranteed to find the shortest path because you you're only taking a new step if you haven't found what you're looking for yet. So it gives you a more structured view of the network. Depending on your specific application, breadth for search or depth for search might be more useful or might be more easily implemented in your specific uh, data set. Dijkstra's algorithm, by contrast, was an algorithm created by Dijkstra uh, in the mid 50s that this explicitly takes into account the weight of the edges. So here, essentially, you're following a similar idea to the breadth for search, but in breadth for search, essentially, you had a concentric shell of nodes, and you wouldn't move to the, onto the next shell until, essentially, you've explored the, this entire shell. Dijkstra essentially does the same thing, but in a, in a weighted fashion. So you don't create, you don't move on to the next step. Unless, of course, you already found your destination node. And you only move on by extending the shortest path. So at each step, you start, you're looking for what is the node that has the shortest distance so far, and then you're trying to extend the path, that specific path. So it, because at each step, you're only looking for the smallest, the shortest path, you will eventually grow to encompass the entire network, but always with the shortest path. So mathematically, you're essentially only updating the distance to, the near, to each of the neighbors by adding that extra weight, if that weight makes the distance smaller if the weight between edges i and j makes the, the distance from the origin to node j smaller than it was before. Uh, you can relatively easily modify this algorithm to keep track not just of the distances between the nodes, between the origin and every other node, but also the paths that it takes to, re to reach every other node. So you can extract both the distances and also the path, the routing instructions on how to reach that. Uh, there are a few constraints to this algorithm. It's of course assuming that the graph is weighted, that each edge has a has a weight. Okay, and of course you can apply it to unweighted graphs by just saying that each 
hedge as a, as a weight of 1. The weights have to be positive because it's adding up the weights and checking if this has become smaller. So if there was a negative weight, you could keep adding the same edge over and over again, and you keep reducing the distance, which of course is nonsensical for this specific use case. And if you have unweighted graphs, eventually what you will find is the same thing you would find with a breath for search. You're just doing it in a more uh, inefficient way. So here you find again that you have these relatively structured exploration of the network, but you're always finding the shortest way to reach any other node from the origin. Now that we have an understanding of how these algorithms work and what are their pros and cons, let's look at our dataset for the section. And for this, we're going to use the OpenStreetMap dataset. You can think of OpenStreetMap as essentially being an open source version of Google Maps or Apple Maps. Another way of defining it is simply as the Wikipedia of maps. Right? You can Anyone can go and edit it. So you can add information to a specific street or a specific intersection, a specific point of interest, and so on. This map is an extremely large uh, XML database that represents all the nodes and all the edges. Nodes typically correspond to intersections or points of interest. Edges essentially correspond to roads connecting nodes. It's fairly hard, or at least a little bit uh, complex and computational intensive to actually extract and analyze this a graph from this XML representation. Fortunately, there is the OSMNX uh, Python package that essentially allows you to query the, the database online and extracting just the part of the network that you, that you are interested in. Uh, OpenStreetMap also includes different types of edges. So you have edges that are for driving, edges that are for walking, and so on, and edges for biking, etc. And essentially, you can query open, the OpenStreetMap servers and say, give me the network for this specific location for and this type of edges only. So in this, this small code snippet here, we're essentially requesting the road network for Manhattan that includes roads where you can drive on. So this will return a network X object, though essentially gives us a simple way of interacting with this graph and applying algorithms in this graph. And essentially what we're trying to do with this graph, which is a nice representation of the island of Manhattan that you have here on the right hand side of the slide, is to automatically identify what is the best way from going from a starting point to a final destination. Here, of course, because we have weighted edges, the weight in each edge is simply the distance, uh, the length of that piece of road. We, we would use Dijkstra's algorithm to essentially find what is the shortest path connecting any two nodes. In this specific example, we're connecting uh, the World Trade Center in Southern Manhattan with Columbia University in up, uh, Uptown Manhattan. Another interesting feature of OpenStreetMap networks is that each edge includes not only the distance the distance that it corresponds to, but also the bearing. And the bearing is essentially the angle from true north that that uh, road is traveling down on. And this gives us a simple way of essentially summarizing the results of our Dijkstra algorithm, but the basic and the results essentially be start at node i, travel 10 meters to node j, then 100 meters to node k, and so on and actually summarize that in a way that's meaningful to us and it actually can actually be useful. So here I'm giving another short snippet of code that essentially what it's doing is that at each 
time it reaches a new node, it checks the bearings of the edge, of the incoming edge and the outgoing edge. And if the difference in angles is sufficiently large, it will tell you to turn right or turn left or turn back, depending on which way the angle is gone. On the other hand, if the angles are relatively close to one another, you, it will just keep saying, keep going or continue on to this other street. The edges also have associated with them street names. So you can also check if the street changes names or if it remains the same street name, even though you're turning around. So this brings us to the end of part two. As I mentioned at the end of part one, there is a GitHub, in the GitHub repository, a Jupyter notebook called Searching in Graphs that essentially goes through this entire process of exploring the Zachary Karate Club network and then also downloading the Manhattan uh, OpenStreetMap network and running Dijkstra's algorithm on, on it, extracting the path on this weighted graph, and then using that path to extract essentially turn-by-turn -turn directions. And the, if you were driving from, in this specific example, from the World Trade Center to Columbia University, it will tell you exactly how to get there. So this is a simple example of how you using graph algorithms in your own daily life. So every time you use Google Maps or Apple Maps for driving directions, somewhere in the cloud, Google or Apple are essentially running one of these simple routing algorithms to help you navigate the, the city or the country. And again, I would encourage you to explore in detail the Jupyter Notebook that reproduces this entire analysis from scratch. Let's now move on to graph connectivity. So far, we mentioned at the beginning that you can have graphs that are not entirely connected. So we had the, in our little toy example, we had node F that you can have any incoming edges. In practice, you can actually have a graph that's composed of different subgraphs that have no edges in between them. So this is, so we say that the graph is disconnected. And as our example of data set that we're going to use to explore graph connectivity, we're going to be talking about the Bitcoin transaction network. So you might have heard of Bitcoin. Bitcoin was the first uh, popular cryptocurrency. It was introduced by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2009, and it provided essentially the first anonymous peer-to-peer -peer blockchain based cryptocurrency. In the last 12 years or so, literally thousands of other cryptocurrencies have been launched, some using the same ideas and the same framework as Bitcoin, others taking completely different approaches. Uh, for a particular example, we're going to use the Kaggle Bitcoin transaction dataset that allows you to download a set of 1.5 million transaction records. But before we can actually use this data set and able to extract a graph from it, we actually have to understand it a little bit better of how Bitcoin is organized and how it's structured. Bitcoin as I mentioned, it's called a blockchain-based cryptocurrency, and it's called it's known as a blockchain because you have blocks of transactions, and each block refers to the immediately previous block in the long continuous chain. This is done in in a fancy way using uh, essentially cryptographic. Uh, techniques that mean that if you try to modify any of the blocks, you have to modify every other 
consecutive block because otherwise the, you're essentially breaking the links if you try to make any changes. And this results in a secure, unmodifiable data structure because it's extremely computationally intensive and extremely computationally costly to actually modify and to recompute the entire blockchain from scratch simply because you made this a change. Each of these blocks, in addition to some header information, all contains a set of transactions. Transactions, you can think of them as being nodes, and they're the, fund the fundamental concept of the Bitcoin blockchain. A transaction essentially has one or more inputs and produces one or more outputs. The inputs are essentially amounts of Bitcoin that are coming into this transaction, while the outputs are amounts of Bitcoin that are going out of this transaction. So you can think of the node as, as being an, an encapsulation of the flows of money or flows of Bitcoin coming in being distributed to uh, other accounts. So you come. the inputs from one transaction are simply the outputs of previous transactions. So you can build a chain of, or a graph rather, directed a cyclical graph, directed because you can, the outputs of one transaction can only go towards inputs of a future transaction. So you have a temporal ordering of the transactions. And it's acyclical, of course, because you do have this temporal ordering, you can't use as the input for a past transaction and an output of a future transaction. The total sum of inputs, total sum of the amount of the inputs has to equal the total sum of the amounts of the outputs. Any difference between the total inputs and the total outputs is considered to be a fee that you're paying to the Bitcoin miners so that they will process the your transaction. You don't have to actually pay any fee unless you want to, but miners can choose which transactions they process. So transactions that have larger fees will be processed faster than transactions with smaller fees. Now it's easy to see that you do have this directed cyclical graph this graph will not necessarily be uh, connected. Right? You can have different addresses, different transactions, different inputs that never interact so, so that one part of the network never actually touches the other part of the network. So this brings us to the idea of components. And here we're kind of zooming out a little bit and moving back towards a more general graph theory approach or graph theory concepts. So going back to our simple uh, Toy network, and here we're, we remove the few edges so that we have three different components. Uh, so we have disconnected uh, nodes, which can be their own individual components, like in this case, node F, and then you have two other components, in this case, A, B, and C, and for one, and E and D for the other one. Each of these components uh, is connected by definition, right? You, all the nodes are interconnected to to each other. A, an intuitive way of thinking about it is if I were to pick up, if this was a physical graph and I were to pick up node B, nodes A and C would come would come along, while nodes E, D, and F would remain on the on the table. The largest component of a graph is often called the giant connected component or the largest connected component. Graphs that have a single component are called connected. Uh, in the case of directed graphs, you have to distinguish between essentially two different cases. You can have a strongly connected graph, and what this means is that each node is accessible from every other node while following only the direction of the edges. Or you can have a weakly connected component where you can go from each node to every other node if you ignore the edge direction. So 
let's consider a simple a simple example. So here we have a network that obviously has two uh, large subnetworks, two large components, and these are weakly connected components. So each edge here is represented by a little arrow that correspond that shows you the direction that you're traveling in along this edge. And you can see that if you start on a node on the component on the left, there is no way to reach a node of component on the right. And if you simply ignore the direction of the edges, then you can go from any node to any other node within a given component. So the weakly connected components, in the case of directed networks, is similar to the uh, intuition I gave you of picking up the graph, picking up a node, and checking which other nodes come attached to it. In the case, in this uh, mental image, the direction of the arrows is not meaningful. It's just, do you have a connection or don't you have a connection? And so this is the simplest uh, version and the most in some cases, the most intuitive version of the way of determining components in a graph. On the other hand, for strongly connected components, you're imposing the constraint, the other constraint, that you're only allowed to travel along the direction of the edges. And essentially what this will do is it will break down the weakly connected components into small subcomponents. So here we have, in a, instead of having the two weakly connected components had before, we have several other components where each of the previous components is actually broken down into smaller uh, pieces. And here I'm representing each of the components by a different color, and you can see that we have essentially one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different components, even though we have still just the same set of 16 edges, or rather 16 nodes that we had before. When we apply the weakly connected components to the Bitcoin transaction network, what we find is a very large distribution of component sizes, and here, Essentially, each weakly connected component corresponds to an individual wallet. And wallets are defined essentially as being addresses controlled by the same individual or the same institution. Now, this becomes apparent, this becomes obvious when you consider that for you to spend uh, the output of a, of a transaction, for you to be able to spend your your Bitcoin, you have to control the address that contains that Bitcoin. So you have to control essentially the output of a transaction. So any addresses that are used as inputs for a single transaction have to be controlled by the same person. And that's why when you use the weakly connected components, you identify the weakly connected uh, component algorithm to identify the weakly connected components, you're essentially identifying these wallets, these clusters of accounts that are controlled by the same individual or the same institution. And even in this small sample of just 1.5 million transactions, you immediately see that most individuals can have only one or two addresses, while a few individuals control tens of thousands of addresses. Uh, these are known as whales. And a simple example of these would be also online exchanges that essentially handle the wallets for, for millions of individual users. So you can see in this plot, we're plotting the fraction of the cumulative fraction of addresses as a function of the component size that essentially half of the total addresses belong to components of size less than 10. So they're in small wallets where while a few addresses belong to these very large wallets of 100,000 uh, addresses or more.
this is the end of part three. I'll remind you that there is in the GitHub repository the corresponding GitHub, the corresponding Jupyter notebook implementing the weakly connected component, the strongly connected component algorithms, and also processing the Bitcoin transaction network that we obtained from, from Kaggle. The, data, the necessary data files are actually included inside the data directory of the of the github repository so the whole notebook is self-contained and reproduces the entire analysis and essentially regenerates all the figures that were used in this specific part of our tutorial now let's move on to the fourth and final part of our tutorial, we're going to look at social networks, in particular using the Twitter, uh, a sample of a Twitter reply network. Before we do that, all right, we have to introduce some new concepts. Uh, and one of the concepts we have to introduce is that of a random graph. So I mentioned briefly in the beginning that some graphs are random and these tend to have a Poissonian or Gaussian degree distributions. The most common model, the most famous model for a random graph is that known as the erdos rainy graph which is created in 1959 by two hungarian mathematicians paulus er erdos and alfred rainy and the idea behind this model is very simple you so this was actually generate a synthetic network a model network uh, you can start with n disconnected nodes and then you check each pair of nodes so all the possible pairs and at, for each possible pair you flip a coin and if the coin comes out heads you connect you create an edge between these two nodes if it comes out tail you don't of course this will not be a fair coin this will be a coin that only comes up heads with probability p in general the value of p will be much smaller than one so be a very unfair coin uh, if you do this process you will end up with p over 2 times n n minus 1 edges so this is essentially uh, the p fraction of all pairs between n nodes the average degree of course will just be p n minus 1 this is often summarized as simply a p n if n is is much larger than 1 so if you want to obtain a network of a sp specific average degree then you simply have to choose p to be the average degree divided by n. You can perform some relatively simple algebra and find the degree that this degree distribution will follow this Poissonian uh, behavior. And one interesting part uh, point of this distribution is that there are no hubs, so all the nodes have a, a number of edges have a degree that is relatively similar to another relatively close to the average right you never have any large deviations from this in the jupyter notebook we actually generate a, a network following this algorithm and here we're showing you the comparison between the the simulated network our model network in blue and the theoretical degree distribution in purple and you can see it's actually a very good agreement so that our algebra and our uh, coding skills haven't failed us yet and now that we have this simple example network we can introduce another concept and this concept is that of the clustering coefficient the clustering coefficient essentially is telling you how many of your friends know each other uh, you can think of this and you can measure this by looking at the num possible number of pairwise combinations of uh, nodes of degree k or rather of ki nodes so how many pairs of how many friendships can you create among your k neighbors this of course is just k k minus one over two so the the classing coefficient is the number of triangles so the number of your friends that know each other divided by the total number of possible friendships by the total number 
of possible edges between your frames. So to illustrate this point, let's look at a simple uh, example of four nodes. So here we're measuring the clustering coefficient of node zero in these four different scenarios. Node zero in all four cases has degree three, but in the first case and the top left-hand corner, uh, it, none of its neighbors know each other, so the degree is zero. And the top right-hand corner is that we added a new edge, so we created a friendship between nodes one and nodes two. So now the crossing coefficient is one third. So you only have one possible edge, one edge out of the three possible ones. In the bottom left-hand corner, we add the second edge, this time connecting nodes two to nodes three. So now the crossing coefficient is two thirds because we have two of the possible edges connecting uh, our friends. And finally, in the bottom right-hand corner, we have class in degree of one, because all of my three friends know each other. They're all friends with one another. So you can see how this simple value is giving me a lot of information about the neighborhood of a node and how well connected its neighbors are. In practice, what we typically do is you take the, you compute the classing coefficient for each node. So in this case, it's just for node zero. And then you take the average across all nodes. And when you look, uh, take the average across all nodes, you'll, you'll find that social networks tend to have relatively high clustering uh, values, while other networks, technological networks, biological networks, etc., will have practically zero clustering networks. In the case of the, the Erdos-Renyi graph that we introduced before, the only way for two of my friends to be connected is for the edge between them to be to, to come up heads when I flip my coin. The probability for that is p, so the clustering coefficient will be p. So it's uh, so we are showing that this simple erdos model produces a classing coefficient that's very small because it's not considering any correlations between the way the nodes are connected. Another concept we have to introduce is that of the network diameter. So we kind of briefly mentioned this as being the average distance, shortest distance between, between nodes. And the concept was originally introduced by Stanley Nugram in the late 60s, where he was trying to answer this question of how many friendship steps separate on average any two people in the US. Uh, mm -hmm. And he measured this by essentially running uh, an experiment where he asked participants in Kansas and Nebraska to send a letter to a specific stockbroker in Boston. Uh, the trick, of course, was that they couldn't just mail the letter directly to the stockbroker. They had to give it in hand to someone that they knew well, that they think might be closer, might know, the, or at least be more likely to, to know the stockbroker. Uh, it did this for several um, hundred uh, letters, several hundred participants. Only a quarter of the letters actually reached the destination. Of course, many letters got lost somewhere along the way. And at the end, when you look at the statistics of all the letters that arrived, so in the end there were only 44 uh, letters that arrived, you, you find that on average it took six steps to reach the, the, the broker. So this became known in the popular culture as the six degrees of separation, the idea being, in, being that any two people in the US or even in the world are separated by at most, on average, six steps. This also resulted with the advent of large online data sites in the, early, in the late 90s and early 2000s with the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. So this uses the IMDB, the Internet Movie Database, database to connect actors to Kevin Bacon, so it became a game of trying to find a path connecting any actor to 
Kevin Bacon. The reason Kevin Bacon was was chosen specifically is because he's an actor that worked on many different movies of different genres with many different actors. So it's a very central uh, actor. is an actor with a very large degree. So here I'm showing you an example of how to connect Angelina Jolie to Kevin Bacon, saying Angelina Jolie was in The Good Shepherd in 2006 with Robert De Niro, which was in Sleepers in 1996 with Kevin Bacon. Uh, and here you'll note that this path actually covers nodes of two different types. You have actors and you have movies. So this is known as a bipartite graph. So this is a graph where you have nodes of two different kinds. <clears throat> and you only allow edges from nodes of one kind to nodes of the other kind and never within its own kind. More recently, around 2012, Facebook decided to perform a similar experiment to what Stanley Milgram did, essentially measured the average shortest path between all of its uh, users. And they found that the average distance between all pairs of users in Facebook is only four steps. So it, this seems to indicate that between the 50s and between 1956, when Milgram ran this experiment, and 2012, when Facebook did, that the world became smaller. That Facebook somehow brought us together. Now that we have the concepts of clustering, the concepts of shortest path or diameter, we can introduce the watt strogatz model. So the Strogatz model was, is, again, like the other training model, uh, simple theoretical model to generate artificial networks that have specific properties. It was introduced in 1998 by Duncan Watts and Steven Strogatz that essentially tries to go beyond the Erdos-Rainy type graph to add this extra component of high clustering, which is something you see in real world networks like social networks, but is impossible to reproduce with the erdos type models. And also the relatively shortest diameter of the graph. It's also typical of social networks. Uh, the way the Wasserkatz models work is essentially you start with a random, or rather with a regular graph, with a regular circle or ring of nodes. Each node is connected to k over two neighbors to the left and k over two neighbors to the right. And then with probability p, you rewire each of these edges at random. So as you increase the probability p, you're moving closer and closer to the erdos rheny uh, limit. If p is zero, you remain a perfectly regular graph, but for intermediate uh, values of p, something interesting happens. What you end up with is, is a graph that still has a large clustering coefficient, just like the ring network does because you're connected to all your neighbors, uh, to all your k neighbors, and they're also very highly connected among themselves. But by rewiring some of the edges, you're actually able to create shortcuts in the structure of the graph and essentially reduce the diameter of the graph. So when you do, the, when you scan several values of p, this is the behavior you observe. So here I'm plotting in the blue stars the clustering coefficient, while the purple circles correspond to the diameter of the network. And you can see as we increase the value of p, the clustering coefficient remains relatively high, and then it starts decreasing, while the diameter of the network Work decreases very quickly after that. So for intermediate values that I'm highlighting here in light orange, you can have both a high clustering and a low diameter, which is much closer to real world networks. Uh, this was a good step forward in understanding the structure of real world data sets, real world networks. In practice, for most of the networks that you're interested in, like the airport transportation network we saw in the beginning, you have to use more sophisticated models like preferential attachment type models that also have these properties, but 
are able to produce broad tailed degree distributions. For our purposes, the, introducing these two models is enough just to explain what we are, we are trying to do. For this section, as I mentioned, the data set we're going to be using is a small sample of the Twitter network. You might be familiar for, uh, with, with Twitter, which is an online social network. The edges are directed. I can follow you and you may or may not follow me. So the edges point in one direction. And you can have different kinds of edges. So the typical edges you find are the follower network. So I follow you or you follow me or both. On top of that, you can also have interaction networks. So you can have mentions when I tag you in a tweet or I reply to one of your tweets, or I can retweet something you posted or you can retweet something I posted. So that creates these three layers on the graph. Of course, the nodes in each of the layer are the same. They're just the individual users, but the different edges correspond to different ways of interacting, different social uh, structures. In particular, we're going to use the Higgs discussion network. So this is a small sample of Twitter users discussing the announcement of the Higgs boson in 2012. A couple of years later, this would be the Nobel Prize in Physics, I'm going to say in 2014, if I remember correctly, maybe 2013. Uh, so it was a big event because people have been speculating, in particular Higgs has been speculating about this boson that is able to create mass, essentially is responsible for particles in the universe having mass, having weight. Uh, I've been speculating about it since the 60s, so finding it experimentally was a big, uh, was a big deal. So this was uh, officially announced on July 4th, 2012. Uh, the data set you can download from the Stanford Network Analysis Proce uh, Project and it contains 38,000 nodes and about 32,000 edges. The strongest connected component is only 322 nodes, while the weakly connected component is over 12,000 nodes. And the SNAP project, so the Stanford Network Analysis Project, actually includes the, the reply network, the follower network, and the retweet network. We're going to look just at the reply network. As you might expect, discussion networks tend to be uh, typically disconnected. So I can reply to you, you reply to me, but we don't interact with anybody else. So this results in a very large number of components. So here we're plotting the, the number of nodes for each of the 30,000 or so components we have in our network and also the distribution of component sizes. So we see that most components have only one or two nodes, while the largest component has several hundred nodes. This is what the largest component uh, looks like. So this are the 322 nodes that are part of the largest strongly connected component. Here we're representing also the arrows connecting in the edges to represent the way these uh, replies worked. So you can see that the, the structure of the network, the size of the node corresponds to the degree. So you can see that larger nodes are more well connected than smaller nodes. And once you measure the, the clustering coefficient and the diameter of the network, you'll find that it has relatively well-behaved values of the crossing coefficient and, uh, and the diameter as we'd expect. You can find the final notebook for this tutorial in the GitHub repository as before. It includes all the analysis for the Erdogan network, the Westergaard network, and even the Higgs reply network. So this is is all that I have to present to you today. I hope, truly hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I would again recommend you sign up for the grass 4 uh, Substack on, online so you'll get more content from me directly. Feel free to reach out to me on social media, on the website, through email, even on, on LinkedIn. 
with any questions or comments that, that you might have. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.